Hello and welcome to another TLDR Explains video. The European Commission is arguably the most well-known EU institution. The Commission is effectively the EU's executive branch, putting it at the forefront of the EU and giving it continuous news coverage. You'll find almost all news stories related to the Union come back to the Commission, and as a result, it's made some of the Commission faces quite famous. The Commission's prominence is not without reason. As you may remember in a previous video, it plays a crucial role in almost every aspect the Union is concerned with. From legislating to administrating, the Commission certainly does a whole lot. In this video, we dive a little deeper into what the Commission actually does, and how some of the most important figures in the European Union are put into power. Before we dive in, a shout out to our merch store. We have a bunch of new items up. Some just reflecting our brand, our characters and our logo, and others just on the idea of the EU and European unity. If you like any of the designs or want to see more, then head over to our Teespring store. It's linked down below. And on our website, we have our Countries with Shoes magnets and stickers. If you like any of these new designs or want to see more, then head over to our stores. Both are linked down below. Let's start with the Commission's composition. The Commission consists of 27 commissioners, one from each state, each being assigned an individual portfolio. For example, the Dutch Commissioner Frans Timmerman is tasked with the development of the European Green Deal, while the French Commissioner Thierry Brenton deals with affairs related to the internal market. In this sense, the Commissioners are a bit like ministers you see in a state. However, the Commission is not really a government. And that's because the European Union is not actually a state. As we saw in a previous video, this means that the EU is not sovereign. However, all 27 member states are sovereign, and their sovereignty must be respected. Hence, they must explicitly make the EU competent through the Lisbon Treaties. The Commission only exercises these competences, so calling it a government is not really appropriate. While this discussion on the term may seem a bit nitpicky, it's actually quite a sensitive topic. This is because of the EU constitution that was rejected in 2005. The EU constitution was meant to be a constitution for all the EU, but was considered as going too far in making the EU powerful like a sovereign state. Next to their individual portfolio, some commissioners have an additional function. Within the commission, there are currently eight vice presidents. A vice president of the European Commission is a subhead within the Commission, below the Commission president, under which several other commissioners are grouped under a particular policy focus area. Next to that, one of the vice presidents is the first vice president, who takes over from President von der Leyen in her absence. Currently, this is a position granted to Franz Timmerman. Finally, one of the vice presidents is the high representative whose portfolio consists of the EU's foreign policy and representing the EU internationally. So that's what the Commission looks like. Now let's turn to how the Commission is installed. You may remember that the new von der Leyen Commission was installed sometime after the European parliamentary elections. Whilst it's true that the European Parliament gets a vote in appointing the Commission, the European Commission nomination works slightly differently. The first initiative lies with the European Council. The European Council is the gathering of heads of government from every member state. In a sense, it's a special configuration of the Council of Ministers, where specific ministers from each state convene, depending on the issue being discussed. The appointment of the Commission is quite a special thing, so in this case, it's actually all of the heads of government for each of the EU states, the likes of Merkel and Macron. Together, they agree on the Commission President, currently von der Leyen, and a high representative. Then the Commission President nominates another 25 commissioners to create a proposed commission. After this process, the proposed commission is laid before the European Parliament. There they'll be asked questions in a sort of public job application. The Conference of Presidents of the European Parliament, which is a special administrative body within the European Parliament, may vote for the approval of individual nominees, after which the proposed commission is set for a final vote. This vote is won by the European Parliament as a whole. Unlike the vote by conference presidents of the European Parliament, the European Parliament itself can only say yes or no to the proposed commission as a whole. If they reject, then the entire process has to be started from scratch. 
So why is there such a complicated process in place? Well, it must be ensured that each sovereign member state must have a say in the Commission's appointment. If you look at the treaties and see all the stuff the Commission is tasked with, you'll see that the Commission is a very powerful institution. The Commission is firstly tasked with the promotion of the EU's general interest. This means it must come up with a plan for what the EU is going to do over the next couple of years and represent the EU for the rest of the world. This also means that it negotiates international agreements, like Brexit. Secondly, the Commission oversees the proper application of EU law. It ensures the application of Lisbon treaties as well as EU laws. It may sue member states who fail to correctly and timely implement EU law before the EU Court of Justice. For market competition law, it also imposes administrative sanctions to disobedient companies from within the EU as well as outside of it something in particular that President Trump has taken issue with over the last couple of years. Thirdly, the Commission wields many executive powers. One of these is taking part in setting the EU spending priorities and budget, including the one you might have heard of in the news or our recent video where the EU Council has not been able to agree on the current budget. Further, the Commission monitors the actual spending of the EU money, like, for instance, on agricultural subsidies. Next to that, they also supervise management programmes and coordinate EU agencies like Frontex, who are charged with guarding the EU's outer border. Finally, the Commission, not the Parliament, is the instigator of legislation within the EU. So that's the role of the EU Commission, and explains why the process of selecting them is so rigorous. You now also know why it is that when news comes out on the European Union, the Commission normally features. Most of what the EU does is driven by the Commission, both in relation to governance and in plans for the future. The final thing to discuss is what can be done in case the Commission performs badly and must be held to account. Apart from the possibility of member states or other EU institutions taking the Commission to court, the European Parliament itself has some tools to sack the Commission. Just like the House of Commons can issue a vote of no confidence against the government, the European Parliament can dissolve the Commission as a whole. There's one key difference though. Unlike no confidence votes, the European Parliament's vote can only be targeted against the entire Commission. It cannot no confidence individual ministers. This makes the European Parliament's sacking vote quite the nuclear option. And it's also why it's never been used before. It requires quite a lot of political support from within the Parliament. A new Commission is not easily installed, and it sends an overall bad message to the world about the European Union as a whole for one of its most important institutions to be sent home entirely. But this doesn't mean that the European Parliament cannot apply political pressure. If one particular commissioner is underperforming or untrustworthy, the Parliament can threaten the entire commission to be sent home unless that specific commissioner resigns. So far, this threat has been enough for Parliament to make sure that when truly necessary, the commission can be budged and has the power to force individual commissioners to resign. So, do you think the structure of the Commission is done well? Do you think there's a good balance, in one hand, of making sure that decisions and proposals can be made quickly by the Parliament appointing 27 individuals, and on the other hand, making sure that these powerful individuals are held to account? Do you back reform proposals that offer viable solutions to some of the problems you might see in the Commission? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. You can also get involved in the conversation over on Discord. There's a link to the server down below, and by joining, you can take part in discussions on topics ranging from US politics and the 2020 election to gaming and philosophy. Join the approaching 2,000 people on the Discord today by discussing a variety of topics from a variety of different perspectives. You can also discuss our videos, and if you're a patron, you can access a super exclusive bonus channel where you can talk to Team TLDR as well as other patrons. Check out the Discord today by clicking the link in the description. Of course, we'll continue to keep you updated on the European Union and all of the news that comes out of it, so be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified every time we release a video. Special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible.